And is this lieutenant of the Lanweir really going to be our envoy at the Diet? Yes, indeed. And the choice is a good one. Herr von Bismarck is fresh, strong, and will certainly be equal to all the claims your royal highness can make on him. Okay, the capital of North Dakota is named after what German ruler? Hitler! Hitler, North Dakota? Bismarck! Bismarck! Oh? Hitler! Hey, I'm still beating you, boy. Okay. Otto Edward Leopold von Bismarck was born into a well-off Prussian family in 1815 at Schoenhausen, a noble estate in Prussian Saxony. His father, Karl Wilhelm Frederick von Bismarck, was a former Prussian military officer and owner of a Junker estate, whereas his mother, Wilhelmine Louise Meck, inherited from a respected Berlin family, which had connections to senior government officials. A short time after he was born, the aristocratic family relocated to the Pomeranian estate, northeast of Stettin, where Bismarck would spend his idyllic childhood. Bismarck received his education in various elementary and secondary schools. Later on, he pursued his higher studies in law at the University of Göttingen from the years 1832 to 1833, before he joined the University of Berlin from 1833 to 1835, while serving as an army reservist in Grafswald in 1838. Bismarck also pursued studies in agriculture at the University of Grafswald, however, he did not really take his studies seriously, often preferring to party with his friends. As a young man, Bismarck outwardly appeared to be a typical Prussian Junker from a militaristic background, which is an image he actively cultivated by wearing uniforms, which for the longest time was solely decorated with a Prussian lifesaver medal, which he earned by saving a drowning cavalryman in the year 1842. However, Bismarck also had a cosmopolitan education and displayed conversational prowess and charisma. Although Bismarck initially aspired to pursue a diplomatic career, he soon embarked on a practical training as a lawyer in Aachen and Potsdam. However, he soon relinquished this path after endangering his professional prospects by taking an authorized leave to um, pursue romantic involvement. Following his mother's death in his mid-twenties, he returned to manage the family estates at Schoenhausen, coming as a relief to Herr Bismarck, escaping the dreadful Prussian bureaucratic system. At around the age of 30 years old, Bismarck exchanged vows with Johanna Putkammer in 1847. Bismarck and Johanna enjoyed a long and harmonious relationship. Johanna was a reserved and deeply religious Lutheran, which no doubt changed the mad Bismarck into a more pious and thoughtful man, being a significant catalyst for his future culture camp. In 1847, the 32-year-old Bismarck was selected as a representative to the newly established Prussian legislature known as the Vereinigte Landtag. During this time, Bismarck was no different than any Prussian estate holder, gaining a reputation as a royalist and even a reactionary. Indeed, Bismarck openly espoused the belief in the divine right of monarchs to rule, hence solidifying his position as a staunch supporter of the Holozon ruling family. In the March of 1848, Prussia found itself amidst a revolution, which was part of the wave of liberal revolutions that swept across the continent of Europe, whose seed lay ultimately in the ideals of Napoleon and liberalism. The Prussian monarch, King William Frederick IV, initially failed, or rather refused to use the military force to suppress the rebellion raising discontent among Prussian officers. In an attempt to appease the liberals, the king made numerous concessions. For example, he promised to establish a constitution to support the eventual merging of Prussia and other German states into a single nation, as well as several other concessions. Ever the erratic young man, and seen his worst enemies, the liberals, in control, the staunch traditionalist Bismarck had endeavored to rally the peasants on his estate to form an army and march to Berlin to defend the king even traveling to Berlin incognito to offer his services, but was instead instructed to assist in arranging food supplies for the army from his estate just in case they had need of it. Unsatisfied, Bismarck attempted to remove the concessionist king by all means, and Bismarck attempted to place Frederick William, a teenage Holozon prince, on the Prussian throne as a replacement for Frederick William IV. However, Augusta vehemently rejected the idea and developed a strong dislike for Bismarck. At this time, Bismarck had not yet become a member of the Landtag, the lower house of the new Prussian legislature. Luckily for the Prussian traditionalists, the liberal movement eventually collapsed by the end of 1848 due to eternal conflicts. Meanwhile, the conservative forces had successfully regrouped and formed an inner circle of advisors around the king, and they had regained control of Berlin. Although a constitution was granted, its provisions fell short of the revolutionaries' demands. In 1849, Bismarck was elected to the Landtag. At this stage of his career, he opposed the unification of Germany. 
arguing that it would lead to the loss of Prussia's independence and be an abatement on her glory. However, he reluctantly accepted his appointment as one of Prussia's representatives at the Erfurt Parliament, as the Assembly of German States convened to discuss plans for unification. Bismarck participated in the Parliament to effectively oppose its proposals. The Parliament's efforts to achieve reunification failed due to a lack of support from Prussia and Austria, the two principal German states. In the September of 1850, following a dispute over the electorate of Hesse, which was known as the Hesse Crisis of 1850, Prussia suffered a humiliating defeat and was forced to back down by Austria. As a result, a plan for German reunification under Prussian leadership was abandoned. In 1851, Frederick William IV appointed Bismarck as Prussia's envoy to the Diet of the German Confederation in Frankfurt. Bismarck relinquished his elected seat in the Landtag, but was later appointed to the Prussian House of Lords. In Frankfurt, he engaged in a battle of wills with the Austrian Count Frederick von Thun and Hohenstein, the Austrian representative. Bismarck insisted on being treated as an equal with the Austrian and employed petty tactics, such as mimicking Thun when he claimed privileges like smoking and removing his jacket during meetings. During his eight years in Frankfurt, Bismarck underwent significant changes in his political views, which he detailed in numerous lengthy memoranda sent to his superiors in Berlin, no longer under the influence of his ultra-conservative and reactionary Prussian associates. Bismarck became less reactionary and more pragmatic. He grew convinced that Prussia needed to ally with other German states to counterbalance Austria's resurgent influence. This shift in perspective made him more receptive to the idea of a unified German nation. Bismarck gradually came to believe that it was the responsibility of himself and fellow conservatives to take the lead in creating a united nation to prevent being overshadowed. He also recognized that the middle class liberals desired a unified Germany more than they wanted to dismantle traditional societal forces. Furthermore, Bismarck worked to maintain friendly relations with Russia and forge a working relationship with Napoleon III's France, despite objections from his conservative friends. These alliances were necessary to both counter Austria and prevent France from aligning with Russia. In a letter to Leopold von Gerlach, Bismarck famously wrote that it was foolish to play chess when 16 out of 64 squares were declared off limits. Ironically, after 1871, France would become Germany's permanent adversary and eventually aligned with Russia against Germany in the 1890s. Bismarck had become alarmed by Prussia's isolation during the Crimean War, which was in the mid-1850s. Austria had sided with Britain and France against Russia, and Prussia had almost been excluded from the peace talks in Paris. In any case, by the year 1859, the fiercely loyal Bismarck was sent to the Russian Empire and assigned the role of Prussian ambassador. Three years later, Otto von Bismarck was briefly moved to Paris as ambassador to the court of Napoleon III. As such, the Prussian nobleman had years of experience in diplomacy and in foreign affairs under his belt, where he had become seasoned in Russian and French diplomacy. Being a reasonable candidate in a difficult time for Prussia and in a dramatic rise to power, he was suddenly recalled by the new Prussian king Wilhelm I, who succeeded his brother Friedrich Wilhelm IV. On the fateful day of 23 September 1862, von Bismarck was appointed as Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Prussia. It is here that we must take a step back to disentangle the mess that was Prussian politics. For more than two years, King Wilhelm had been stuck in a vicious cycle of political feuds with the Chamber of Deputies over military reform. A military man, the sexagenarian king considered it well within the realm of his power to increase the size of the Prussian military juggernaut. However, the Chamber of Deputies, composed majoritarily of liberal members, refused to approve the budget required for the king's military ambitions. An enraged Wilhelm then refused negotiation or compromise, considering it to be a compromise on state security. He thus prorogued parliament twice resulting in tensions between the king and the members of the Landtag. It is in this situation that the appointment of Bismarck makes much more sense, an appointment of a seasoned diplomat with conservative and loyalist tendencies to save Wilhelm's position and control over the military. Initially, Bismarck's position was shaky due to the distrust of King Wilhelm and the aforementioned hate of Queen Augusta. Yet, Bismarck soon acquired a powerful hold over the king, 
allowing him to focus on the military budget issue. While Bismarck, ever the pragmatist, first proposed a compromise to the king, he was forced to find another solution when this compromise was refused by a staunch Wilhelm. The solution? A loophole Bismarck found in the Prussian constitution, which allowed him to simply collect taxes on the basis of the old budget. This tactic, applied from 1863 to 66, allowed Bismarck to implement military reforms without the sanction of parliament, cementing his image as a brilliant yet firm reactionary. It was within this budgetary context that on September 30th, 1862, that Otto von Bismarck gave his immortal speech to the Prussian House of Representatives where he stressed the utter importance of the strength of Prussia's military for German unification, which was after all the aim of the liberals, by saying, Prussia must collect and keep its strength for the right moment, which has been missed several times already. Prussia's frontiers, as laid down by the Vienna treaties, are not conductive to a healthy national life. It is by no means of speeches and majority resolutions that the great issues of the day will be decided. That was the great mistake of 1848 and 49, but by blood and iron. The liberal opposition, however, chose to ignore Bismarck, and causing a further intensification of the conflict between Bismarck and the liberals. These relations would not get any better following the Alvensleben Convention of 8 February 1863, where Prussia under Bismarck and Russia under Tsar Alexander II agreed on a treaty to quash the Polish January uprising in Congressional Poland. The treaty, however, led to clashes in the Prussian Landtag. The struggle between Bismarck and the Diet continued, as after nearly eight months in office, Bismarck had failed to achieve any agreement with the parliamentary opposition. The straw that broke the camel's back would come in late May 1863, as the Diet sent a sharp note to the king, saying that it could no longer come to terms with von Bismarck. In response, a defiant Wilhelm dissolved the Diet, accusing it of trying to obtain unconstitutional control. Seizing the chance, Bismarck then issued an edict restricting the freedom of the press in an attempt to silence the critics, earning him wide notoriety. Undoubtedly, his popularity shrunk to such an extent that even the crown prince, the rather liberal Friedrich III, voiced his concerns against Bismarck. As expected, Bismarck's supporters fared poorly in the elections of October 1863 where a liberal coalition won over two-thirds of the seats, resulting in calls for Bismarck to be dismissed. Yet, the king stood once again by his iron chancellor, fearing that if he did dismiss the prime minister, he would be succeeded by a more liberal politician. With the storm having somewhat settled, Bismarck had some room for respite to turn to foreign policy. This turn was to kill two birds in one stone. Certainly, Bismarck calculated that a shift to foreign policy would not only allow him to achieve his dreams of German unification, but he also hoped that success on this front would weaken the Prussian people and politicians' desire for political reform, where any diplomatic and military success would shift the intense pressure away from him and the king. The relief would come in November of 1863, with the death of King Frederick of Denmark due to the Schleswig-Holstein question two majoritarily German-speaking duchies which were in union with Denmark. This was because the succession of both duchies was disputed between Christian, the new Danish king, and Friedrich von Augustenburg, a German-Danish nobleman. When King Christian decided to sign the November constitution due to the pressure of his liberal government, a constitution that annexed Schleswig without the agreement of the German Confederation, hence violating the London Protocol, Bismarck denounced the decision and was, essentially, handed over a golden pretext for war. As for the German Confederation, it already acted by December 1863 and sent federal troops to occupy Holstein and Lauenburg. With support from Austria, von Bismarck issued an ultimatum by mid-January 1864 for Christian to return Schleswig to its former status within 48 hours. When Denmark refused, Austria and Prussia invaded the Duchy of Schleswig proper, against the wishes of other Confederate states on the 1st of February 1864. 
sparking the Second Schleswig War. The war was, in short, a disaster for Denmark, who fared poorly on land against the much better equipped Prussian forces with newly armed artillery. Indeed, artillery would prove particularly useful during the siege and battle of Diebel, where Prussian victory by late April 1864 marked the turning point of the war and paved the way for the subsequent Treaty of Vienna on 30 October of that year. In the Treaty of Vienna, Denmark ceded the duchies of Schleswig, Holstein and Lauenburg to Prussia and Austria. Originally, it had been proposed that the Diet of the German Confederation, in which all the states of Germany were represented, should determine the fate of the duchies. But before this scheme could be effected, Bismarck induced Austria to agree on the Gastein Convention. Under this agreement, signed on the 20th of August 1865, Prussia received Schleswig, while Austria received Holstein. The importance of this treaty cannot be understated, as it was engineered by Otto von Bismarck to provoke Austria into war with the aim of undermining Austria as the leader of the German Confederation and achieve a Germany under the Prussian military boot. But the Austro-Prussian War of 1866, also known as the War Between Brothers, will be covered in part 2 of our series on Otto von Bismarck, the founder of a nation.